Well, we started this week's lesson in Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 14, and I had you read that, and it was by design. And let me explain what I mean by that. Um, it's in this passage that the Old Testament law is contrasted with the ministry of Jesus. And it's more specifically not just in general the law and in general the ministry of Jesus. It's one aspect of the law specifically. It's the sacrificial system. And it talks about, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. So the idea is this. Uh, we've got that word perfect in there that kind of throws a loop into some people's interpretation as to what, what's going on here. That idea of perfect or perfection there, uh, it can also be translated as completeness. Okay, so that maybe gives you a little bit uh, more understanding. It could also be fulfillment. So that's interesting based on just the, the study we've been going through. Or uh, the one I kind of always go back to is maturity. Um, so it brings maturity, and in that maturity, we're approaching perfection. Um, we're approaching completeness or fulfillment of what we're supposed to be, right? So, but these uh, Old Testament sacrifices, the shadow, these are incapable of bringing people to maturity. They're incapable of bringing people to their fulfillment, the way their, their completeness. Does that make sense? They couldn't. And the logic is found in verse 2. Why? Well, otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? That's the logic behind these sacrifices and why they are incapable of getting us to the finish line, the ultimate goal of our completeness. It's because of their repetition. Had they been able to get us to our goal, the logic says, they would have been stopped. It would have, it would have been offered and it would have been sufficient. That's the logic, okay? So we know that it's because of this repetitive nature, because they never ended, that they are incapable of getting people to the end goal. And then I want you to notice in verse three, but in those sacrifices, in the shadows of the law, there is a reminder of sins year by year. Did you hear that? Because that should uh, perk your ears up from our study. A reminder. We spent a whole week on reminder, the idea of reminders, right? But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. So they're incapable of getting us to an end goal. What is that end goal? I'm going to suggest to you in a little different language maybe that we have been talking about in this uh, study, the end goal is to live, can you guess? At rest, <laughs> right? And what does that mean? It's in a relationship with God where we are in our place and we are doing our thing that we were created to do without sin or a lack of faith getting in the way or hindering our kingdom work. That is the ultimate goal. That will be fully realized in heaven. I mean, after the second coming, after the final in the end, right? That'd be fully realized. But this Hebrews author talks about the ministry of Jesus as being available to us now, not just an end goal that we have to look forward to only, right? So what does he say? Verse 10, 10, 10. So what's the answer? In contrast to that continual Old Testament sacrifice, which were only shadows of something that was better to come, right? The body of Jesus was offered once. The offering of the body of Jesus once for all. It's the answer to that shadow as our sacrifice. So it's by this one offering that the end goal is available. It's through Jesus, one who is better than the Old Testament shadows. Uh, it's through Jesus that we can brought to, be brought to our maturity. It's through Jesus' ministry that we as humans can be com, uh, completed. We can be whole again. This is the language of Eden, right? It's the humanity's role that was experienced before the fall in Eden. 
we were complete. We were where we were supposed to be. We were doing what we were supposed to do and then sin got in the way and has been hindering us ever since. So it's this Jesus ministry. Now this is, this is, uh, this is easy to understand when we're just talking about sacrificial system. Um, but I want to back up just one verse from that verse 10. And I had you camp on this or had you look at it. He takes away the first in order to establish the second. Who's the he? I don't know if you asked yourself that question. Who's the he that takes away? We might be tempted to say God, and that's a correct answer. But more specifically in this context, who is it that takes away the sacrificial system? And it's Jesus himself. It's Jesus that is doing this. He takes away. So this is very understandable. Uh, most in the church today would not have a problem with me just standing up here and suggesting that uh, we no longer have to sacrifice animals at an altar to experience forgiveness, right? I mean, this is pretty agreeable within the church. It's the same logic, though, that when we take it back into chapter 3 and 4, we will see similar logic being used because this is after three and four, whichever way is after for you, it's this way for me. <laughs> and so um, I, I just wanted to establish this. Jesus is the one that takes away the first. What is he taking away? What's first? In this context, it's the sacrifices. It's the part of the law that were a shadow that were repeatedly observed and that could never bring people to their completeness. He had to take that away. Now think about this logic. He had to take that away because otherwise it would be terribly distracting and probably cause people to focus on the shadows when the substance is available, right? So he takes away the first, not just because he feels like it, but because it has a purpose. The taking away has a purpose so that people can now focus on the fulfillment the thing that can get you to the end because it has arrived in Jesus. And we needed those reminders uh, before his ministry of, hey, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, right? Reminders of sin, reminders of our problem, okay? So I brought you to this passage first because, again, nobody, nobody complains when we talk about sacrifices in this way, that they've been taken away. But Let's take the conversation back to chapter 4, verses 8 through 11. Because I took you there first, the conversation about sacrifice is just to help us in our conversation about rest. Okay? For, and it says, For if Joshua had given them rest, Joshua, for if he had given them rest, he would not have, he would not have spoken of another day after that. Um, that he, again, in the last part of 8, uh, could be understood as David uh, writing the psalm, right? Or God speaking through David, I think is probably more appropriate, but um, a couple different ways you can read that. It's a similar argument happening here. Remember, the reminders of rest in the Old Testament, were they one-time things? No, they were very repetitive. Let's go back through the list. It was a once-a-week reminder. It was Several other times a year reminders attached to festivals. It was every seventh year reminder. It was every 50th year reminder. And then uh, the ultimate goal was the land, right? The ultimate picture of rest is all this happening in the land. But what's happening when they get into the land? It's a continual repeating reminder. And what does that repetition tell us? coming out of the Hebrews 10 passage. It tells us that the reminders here of rest are incapable of what? Getting us to our final destination, to our completeness, to our fulfillment as people. It's the, it's the same logic that we just came out of. In actuality, um, I, have, I have suggested to you that these shadows out of the Old Testament of Sabbath rest are reminders of a rest that was lost. But using the logic coming out of Hebrews 10, where sacrifices are a reminder of, do you remember? Sin. Okay, it's not a reminder of perfection, although it is at the same time. When you're reminded about sin, what are you also reminded of? 
oh, I got a problem. <laughs> that hopefully can be solved, right? So every time these reminders of rest come about every week, every time around a festival, every seven years, every time these reminders come up, you're being reminded the way I've presented it of a rest that is no longer available, but from a Hebrews 10 standpoint, it could be said that they are reminders of unrest. Because in the Old Testament, if you're observing the seventh day Sabbath, Saturday night's a coming. You know what I mean by that? <laughs> you gotta get back to work, right? And, and we all know that as uh, Monday's a coming, <laughs> right? We all know that, that terminology. And when we say Monday's a coming, uh, what's the general attitude behind that idea? Oh, got to go back to work, right? So by taking a day off and resting, what you're being reminded of is that you are living the majority of your life in unrest. And at the same time, you're being reminded of a time when there was rest, and hopefully that that can be restored if these practices were uh, able to bring us to maturity in the rest idea, um, they would be able to get us to the end goal, but they're not. Uh, they're a repetitive nature. Um, if this logic flows in the same direction as the sacrifices out of uh, Hebrews 10, you should expect it to have the same logical flow with the Sabbath. And we have here in verse 8 of chapter 4, if Joshua had given them rest, he, who? I'm going to suggest somebody different. <laughs> it's not David. It's not God the Father. Who? Jesus. It's Jesus who does what? It's Jesus who takes away the first in order to establish the second. And I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus would not have spoken of another day after the time when everybody was brought into a land of rest and practicing the repetitive nature of rest. Thank God Jesus talks about something else, right? Because we're just in this repetitive cycle of following. If Joshua had given them true rest, God would not have mentioned something else. So there does remain a Sabbath rest. Well, what remains? Um, it's what Jesus offers. If the old has been taken away, it's what Jesus offers. And what I'm going to suggest to you, in, in the same way that it would be distracting if we as a group of believers uh, started buying goats and sheep and built an altar that would be distracting us away from, it's a picture of, but it would be totally distracting us away from a life, the ministry of Jesus himself. I'm going to suggest to you, and this is maybe the most <laughs> poignantly I've said it in this class thus far, and so I'm kind of playing my hand here. <laughs> if we as a group of believers continue to go back to an Old Testament idea of repetitive rest that was only a shadow, when Jesus has come and is offering us something more, we will continue just to be distracted, right? We'll be distracted from what? We'll be distracted from whatever it is that Jesus has to offer. And is it easy to understand what that is? No. But should that stop us? What's the easy thing? The easy thing is to just go back to the repetition. It's a check mark. It's, it's off my list for another week right? And I, I just want to encourage a, a, maybe a change in mindset. Uh, maybe you're a person that grew up uh, hearing Sabbath teaching of any type, the, the, and there's lots of different types of Sabbath teaching out there. Um, I want to s just empower you to hold loosely to that, maybe more loosely than you've held it entirety of, in the entirety of your life, and just contemplate what it is. As we walk through the final weeks of this class, contemplate with me, what is it that Jesus is offering? And is it really just one day a week that he's offering it? Or is it something that's available to us more and better 
on an everyday basis. Um, there's something here right at the end. Uh, I know we're camping on for if Joshua had given them rest. Uh, I mentioned earlier in the class that uh, this word for Joshua in the Greek is Jesus. It's, um, it's the name Joshua, but it's also the exact same name as the name that we translate into Jesus. So when Jesus' parents were given the instructions on how to name him, what they heard was name him Joshua. What we've done for clarity reasons, and I'm not against this, but for clarity reasons, we've translated that one Greek word, Joshua, here, because it's referring to an Old Testament character, and in other places where Jesus exists, and we know it's talking about Jesus, we translate it into the name Jesus, just so we are aware what's going on, okay? A lot more history about how we ended up there. Uh, you can Google it, it's fascinating. Um, the problem is this, earlier uh, translations, most of the early translations of, in English um, didn't have the right translation here. In fact, if you're a King James uh, person, all the King James versions, starting in 1611, going all the way through the 1800s, has the name Jesus there. Which, okay, read that just with me. <laughs> For if Jesus had given them rest... God would not have spoken of another day after that. What does that just do to our argument here? <laughs> the argument of, of what Hebrews is trying to say. It totally dismantles it. It turns it upside down, right? It suggests that the rest that Jesus offers um, isn't the end game. Okay, you see how that's backwards, okay? So uh, thankfully, we, we've caught that and uh, most of our, all of our newer translations have Jesus there. But what I don't want you to pass over is the, the irony that we're supposed to get in this statement, that the author of Hebrews assumes that we're going to get, that the translators of the King James Version didn't get. He mentions Joshua here as the one who brings the Old Testament characters into the shadow of the fulfillment of rest, and it didn't work. It wasn't the end game, in other words. He would not have spoken of another day after that. Who's the he? It's, it, it's the whole subject of the book of Hebrews. It's Jesus. But let's not say it Jesus. What's the irony? For if Joshua had given them rest, Joshua would not have spoken of another day after that. Jesus is the new Joshua. He is one better than the Old Testament Joshua because he brings a better ministry. He brings us into a better land of rest, a place of promise. And he does it not in a shadow world, but he does it in reality. That's the irony that we're supposed to be able to see as we read through that I believe the author of Hebrews expected us to see as, as we work our way through. It's the new Joshua that leads us into our rest.